So without further ado, please may I introduce my colleague, Professor Melinda Dewar, uh, who will host uh, the first of these sessions. Melinda, please. Thank you, James. So I'm hoping everyone can hear me and perhaps James will just wave if you can't. <laughs> Good, thanks. So this is the third year that I've had the privilege of being involved with this event. And after two very successful events, we weren't gonna be put off by COVID this year. And it's thanks to Diane Harris that we've both been able to move this event online and I think put together what I think is gonna be a very thought provoking program. So it's events like these that assist the department to find and develop strategies for positive cultural change and practical steps for building a research and teaching community that works for everyone. And I think there's also the very real hope amongst us that events like these also reach far beyond our department, particularly through our students and postdocs as they go out and develop their own lives. So as James said, our first session is the COVID crisis and racial injustice. And we're very lucky to have two very noteworthy speakers, Dr. Karen Salt and Dr. Maggie Semple. So they will each speak for 15 minutes without questions. We'll then have a little over half an hour for a, a detailed and in-depth and interactive discussion. And I really hope that as many of you as possible join in that. Now you can ask questions during the discussion using the Q&A function. You'll see the button for that at the bottom of your, your Zoom screens. Um, but if for any reason you'd rather not write your question down or that's uh, difficult for you in any way, please use the raise hand function and we'll come to you and you can ask your question verbally. Um, if you do encounter any technical difficulties, please raise them during the chat. And as James said, our technical team will be monitoring that and will do their best to help you. Um, if all else fails, you can email Diane Harris at dh473 at cam.ac.uk. Um, and just to say that the webinar overall will end at 3.30 and the second session after a 15 minute break will be Unseen Disabilities starting at 3.30. The webinar will be recorded and it'll be available on the chemistry department's YouTube channel, which you can access from our, from our site. Now we are using live transcription today uh, to improve the accessibility for anyone for whom hearing is a difficulty. Uh, and you can find that if you haven't already by going to the CC button at the bottom of your screen. It's, it's marked underneath as live transcript. And if you click on that, there'll be the option to have the live transcript. And we tried this yesterday and it seems to work quite well. So then to our first session, the COVID crisis and racial injustice. And our first speaker is Dr. Karen Salt. Now Karen spoke at our event last year and she gave a superb account then of what UKRI are doing in the sense of research culture and trying to change the research environment to improve diversity and make a more inclusive and progressive and productive research environment. Karen has over 27 years experience of working in and with communities, organisations, charities and governmental bodies. She currently supports UKRI External Advisory Group for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion as its Deputy Chair. She recently moved from directing the Centre for Research in Race and Rights based at the University of Nottingham to her current role as a Deputy, sorry, Deputy Director for Research and Development, Culture and Environment within UKRI. And that's a policy area that includes cross-cutting topics such as research integrity and culture, and she contributes their senior leadership to the UK and international conversations about research policy. So Karen, I'm going to hand over to you. Excellent. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful everyone can hear me as well. Um, I, I can see just myself on the screen, um, which, which can be both uh, uh, excellent. Uh, I've got a thumbs up. Um, it can be both, uh, both a bit frightening when you only see yourself and, and also in, in, uh, immensely entertaining because um, you can just have all sorts of conversations um, as you're moving forward. Um, but, uh, but I know you're all there. I can see the numbers uh, increasing uh, at the bottom of the screen. And, um, and I, uh, I am immensely thankful to the organizers for um, inviting me back around once again to share some time and some space with all of you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> oh, and I, I would like to also thank Melinda for the um, gracious introduction. 
um, and uh, and the great chance to spend some time with Maggie. Um, uh, and uh, and I look forward to what both of us will be able to combine um, for all of you today. I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides um, that I want to take you through. Um, uh, thinking thinking quite a bit. So let me just press the right set of buttons. Um, uh, with regards to, there we go, uh, what we're talking about today. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I've kind of titled this again, COVID-19 and our, and our equal futures. Um, for a number of different reasons, uh, I, and, and, and I'm hoping some of these will be more apparent as I go through uh, this kind of bit of a, the short talk. I think part of it is that um, many of you heard in relationship to COVID-19 uh, for, uh, for quite a while from policymakers, pro uh, politicians, uh, average folk who would say, you know, COVID-19 is a great equalizer. And um, data is not supporting that. Um, lived experience is definitely not supporting that. And, uh, and what we're seeing uh, kind of more and more uh, at, at various different scales, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those different scales before I kind of come into research and innovation, um, is, is the long-term sustained sets of inequalities um, that, uh, that have been, you know, a light has essentially been shown on quite a few of them, some which we have known and that we're very familiar with, um, and others that have um, emerged at this time period uh, and, 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 are, and are actually responses to um, our ongoing efforts in some ways to mitigate. Um, but I don't wanna to take too much kind of um, uh, jumping ahead. Um, I wanna to try to talk my way through this. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend so much time talking about um, uh, moves towards racial equality or various forms of um, activism from various communities. Um, you know, I think we can, I can cover any of that if people are interested and are curious, um, you know, ways that communities have come together around uh, uh, creating new burial practices, for example, or, or, or various forms of social and community support. Um, I can cover some of that maybe in the question and answer. Um, I am assured that uh, Maggie will cover uh, quite a bit of this. I want to try to spend a little bit of, of time thinking this through uh, with COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'll do this for a couple of different reasons. I'll start off with talking about um, uh, COVID-19 quite specifically. So this is a, a picture from a uh, uh, new scientist. Um, and, and, you know, I know all of you will know lots of details uh, about um, the coronaviruses and, um, and, 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 and sort of how we got to this moment. Um, but I think it's kind of worth knowing uh, that this is, this is uh, uh, COVID-19 is a set um, uh, and of, of, of a family of viruses that are, are known to us. Um, so this is, this is, we're not entering into a moment of, a, of, an, un, of an unknown entity. Um, uh, but <clears throat> obviously since uh, 2019, um, uh, and, 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 and uh, records are suggesting even earlier than that, um, we've been uh, battling this particular one um, or various mutations of this particular one. Um, and, uh, and, and when we talk about COVID-19, I think in some ways we're talking about a whole set of different things. Um, clearly, on, on, the, on the one hand, we're talking about um, uh, an illness that people uh, uh, obtain, and um, and 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 and, and uh, they could be asymptomatic, um, they could be carriers. We're, we're talking we're talking these sorts of health concerns, um, but we have a whole set of other things that have come about with COVID nineteen. Uh, whether or not we're now talking about passing that on to other sets of people, or if we're talking about health and vitality of, of uh, economics uh, or, or jobs or roles, um, but we're also talking about scale. And, and I think it's worth impressing upon all of you because you're living this right now. That, that, I mean, this particular version of this talk is, is, a, is a product of this. The scale of this transformation globally where we are dealing with from things like surveillance and um, uh, access of data, you know, transmitting that information, massive changes in governments in terms of some governments now uh, providing significant amount of, of, of funding and support 
to all manner of folks within, within the society, all the way through to huge shifts in, in the ways um, learning takes place. Um, interactions take place, dating takes place, relationships. I mean, this is this is a this is a virus that is um, altering uh, everything about societies. Um, and there are places where restrictions are different, um, where um, uh, there there are different sets of choices that have been made. Places that have feel like they've come out the other side. Um, of those sets of, of uh, restrictions or um, particular immediate impacts that they put in, put in place. But this is, maintains itself as a global phenomenon. Um, uh, and anyone who does systems analysis or systems work will not, you know, you cannot help but try to understand the global flows of this from, from the health perspective, all the way through to the perspectives of supply chains, all the way through to, um, as I said, the relationships and, 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 and how this is um, transforming um, uh, how we do nearly everything um, uh, as, as societies. So according to the um, Institute for Fiscal Studies, they, they, they've got a detailed review uh, on inequalities. I think my, my screen is, um, uh, you're not able to see just a little bit, I'll move it down. Um, an analysis of survival among uh, COVID-19 uh, cases, I'm just gonna read the screen, showed that after accounting for the effect of sex, age, deprivation, and region, people of Bangladeshi ethnicity had around twice the risk of death when compared to people of white British ethnicity. People of Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, other Asian, Caribbean, and other black ethnicity had between, between 10 and 50% higher risk of death when compared to um, uh, white British citizens. So we're not necessarily just talking now about, um, uh, 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 oh, I think it moved up, sorry. Um, uh, I will go back to the slide I was going to read first. Um, and this is just picking up, I think, the point that I had started with uh, in my opening comments um, about the world uh, having changed, um, uh, the, the issues that have been raised pre-pandemic, um, and essentially the massive variations that we're seeing uh, in terms of threats to livelihood um, and uh, pre-existing inequalities. Um, and as I alluded to, these, these are very familiar. Um, and this, what I was reading previously, is actually from the, the, the Public Health England report beyond the data. And, and the thing about these reports, when they started coming out, um, uh, you know, we were really in the throes of, of, of working with and responding to uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, labs had transformed themselves in terms of doing work. Uh, huge teams had shifted their, their analysis. Um, but we were also at the same time uh, limiting access to particular sets of facilities. Uh, there were uh, uh, more uh, lockdowns where multiple people were impacted before we went into tears. We've had, a, we've had huge sets of responses to all of this. Um, and also at the same time, huge sets of um, kind of recognition of what was, what was occurring. And the, the numbers of deaths that were occurring uh, disproportionately to different sets of uh, communities um, was definitely matched by other sets of things. And, and we've been investing quite a lot of this within UK research and innovation to try to understand some of these sets of phenomena. But let me give you um, just a bit of a roundup of research. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a kind of observational group that has been gathering research from various different levels um, and spaces. Um, and essentially we know, this is from a, an Ox, the Oxford's co-space study, um, parents and carers level of stress, anxiety and, and depression have increased with the pressures of lockdown. I know many of you uh, may be parents or carers yourself and you, you can likely attest to this. Um, the trade union uh, has, has, has looked at uh, ethnic minority workers have been hit hardest by job losses with some 8.5% um, of, it should be of, Black, Asian, and other minority workers unemployed between July and September. Um, and the Prince's Trust had a recent piece where they were looking at uh, one in four young people, one in four feel unable to cope with life um, since the start of the, the pandemic. So we're not necessarily just talking about um, health disparities or, or health concerns. Um, we're now talking about the whole gamut from those who are right on the front line of, 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 of actually being involved in healthcare, all the way through to all sorts of other sets of people. And again, if we're really thinking about equality and equal features, we really do have to reckon with the seismic shifts and changes 
um, deep exacerbation of, of challenges and issues that are, um, uh, are just rolling through our societies. Because if we're ever going to get to a place where we think about an equal future or one where we are now starting to mitigate or deal with these sets of complexities or issues, we're going to have to address all of these. Um, and we're going to have to do it in a much more coordinated and unified way um, that, that isn't just necessarily one group thinking that they're the only group that has been impacted uh, by COVID-19. So closer to home, um, we, know, we know we've been doing things. As I said, we've been investing in research. Um, uh, UKRI has um, investments like uh, the Understanding Society Survey, uh, which has been doing month by month analysis to, to, to deeply understand um, impacts of COVID-19. Uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies have been studying um, large amounts of differences and variance between those who identify as, as, as male and female, uh, what their home life is like um, and, uh, and, their, and their situations. Um, various places have obviously been involved in pandemic mitigations. Um, I'm, I'm, I would be assured that Cambridge has got business continuity plans in place, um, but that runs a gamut from departments, government departments uh, supplying funds and support all the way through to kind of UKRI. And we've been monitoring all of this. Um, uh, just a bit of a tidbit for you around some of the monitoring. Um, I was uh, started working with teams probably sometime around May of last year to really understand what was the impact, for example, on, on our funding portfolio so that we could understand um, uh, grant applications. Um, and we've known from, from that period of time, even until now, that some of our uh, calls have enormous volume of applications that have come in. Um, and, and, and for things like Innovate UK, it's actually been fairly large numbers uh, of folks who will, will identify as, um, uh, as female um, who are submitting. Um, we know that from journal articles uh, and, uh, and editors who have been talking about um, uh, the effects and things that they've been seeing. And again, I can pick this up potentially in the Q&A, um, but one of the things that we've started hypothesizing and speculating is that actually what we may be seeing are massive shifts that are starting to happen within research and innovation in terms of both the methods people are having and their focus. Um, so while we may be seeing drop-offs in journal entries, we might be seeing sharp increases in funding applications. Um, and what does that ultimately mean if people obviously can't get it back into a lab or go on site to do their work, but they're putting in funding applications? And, and what are we, how are we accounting for these different sets of shifts? How does furlough um, and precarity and these economic impacts on the research and innovation system, how are they exacerbating the, the sets of inequalities we already know that exist, but ultimately as people are looking for financial sustainability um, or, or making all sorts of different sets of strategic choices that may have knock on effects to other parts of the system um, and, and definitely are raising concerns for people about their futures, um, being involved in, in research and innovation. And that's really what brings me to this question of differential impacts and differential futures. Um, again, you know, we, we need to be very focused on this, I think, within research and innovation, which, will, which what will these futures look like? And this is not just a PGR conversation. This is the futures for all of us um, uh, as, we're, as we're thinking about massive shifts to our GDP, to society, to, to our ability to contribute and be involved uh, in, in, in research and innovation, much less be just a member of society kind of moving forward. Um, but a lot of what I've described so far, and this, this is my last slide, um, uh, notes and discusses a lot of things that are troubling and, and very concerning. But there's immense amounts of, of um, moments of brilliance right now um, of, of people sharing data um, and uh, increase of preprints, um, uh, a really just a dedicated sense of kind of openness and transparency of reaching out to their neighbors, of, of picking up food for, for people down the street. Um, I mean, we are seeing this, this level of kind of social support and care for each other that is, um, again, seismic. Um, if we think about the global scale of that, um, we're seeing similar sets of things within research and innovation, where people are making new communities, where they're aligning in ways that um, are breaking down barriers between facilities um, and where people work. Now, how do we embed that? Uh, much more as the ongoing business as usual. 
um, where we remove the competition and the various uh, uh, kind of negative incentives of reward and, and recognition, where we can reset what our culture can be and what we can do, um, where we're not just building back better, that kind of rhetoric and that language, but we're building back equitable in a way that ultimately recognizes um, um, that everybody isn't experiencing this moment in the same way, but we want everyone to have a future within it, right? Um, uh, and to be able to move forward. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that what I've at least presented to you today kind of takes us through a little bit of this moment, reminds you, I think, of the just sort of impact and scale, but also starts to signal some of that transformational work um, um, that, is, that, that is there and, and, and available. And, and I clearly believe that these questions around race and racial equality um, are a part of this. Um, because that has also raised itself quite significantly for people um, as we've been thinking about kind of what those futures might look like um, and those differential impacts. So I'm going to now turn it back over to Melinda, um, who I think will um, um, bring up our next speaker. And so I'll stop sharing now. Okay, I think I'm on my Thank you very much, Karen. That's a huge amounts of food for thought there. Uh, and I've, got, I've already got my list of questions written down here. Um, but we're going to move straight on to our second speaker, Dr. Ma Dr. Maggie Semple, OBE. So Maggie is a successful businesswoman and entrepreneur. She's been described, not by me, as gently formidable. She's a thought leader on agile frameworks, cultural change, diversity, inclusion, and ethics, with a particular emphasis on leadership development and governance. Maggie established the Experience Call, a global consultancy firm in 2001, which provides strategic advice in these areas and more. In 2010, Maggie founded the Semple brand, a luxury bespoke women's wear business and with an online magazine that has over 8 million viewers. Maggie is a fellow of the City and Guilds Institute and was awarded her OBE in 2001. So Maggie, over to you. And, uh... Thank you for that uh, nice introduction. So thank you for that. Let me start by saying um, for all of you and those who've been affected by COVID, my thoughts are with you. Whether you are in the session now or whether you view it later because it's being recorded, my thoughts are with you. Thank you to Cambridge for inviting me to take part in this discussion. I'm very much looking forward to building on what Karen has said and to hearing from our um, audience, our participants. And I'm going to start with a quote. And, someone, and in fact, that some of you will know this person, Duncan Fraser. Um, he worked and has worked very much in the arts. He has a charity called Useful and, Un and Kind Unlimited. And he wrote a blog recently and reminded me of a Martin Luther King quote. And the quote is this. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And this afternoon, I'm going to take three themes in my time that I have with you. One is going to look at the language of diversity. The second is going to just add to the research that Karen quoted a few more examples but from the corporate sector, which is where I mainly work. And the third, to share with you some thoughts about some actions. So let me start with the language of diversity and how I have observed the changing use of language of diversity during the COVID period. So let me start with the BAME acronym. B-A-M-E, and most organizations in the public, private, and uh, charitable sector will describe BAME as Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. Usually that's what people say. And when I now ask people, so why are we still holding on to this categorization? People will argue, well, well, Maggie, we need, um, you know, kind of for data collection, we need to know. And I say, absolutely. So data collection looks like you have a form, you complete it. For me, it would be, you know, black, British, um, and that's what it is. But what happens to the data is, from that information, then suddenly 
some of us get clumped together and put into the BAME category. COVID, I think, and it's always been a discussion, but COVID particularly has helped to really categorise individuals or different communities within that BAME overall heading. You know, when I die, I know that my tombstone could have on it, Maggie Sample, she lived under hyphen. Now, I know that was dramatic of me to say that, but it's what I mean. I was born in London and I was dealt my cards, as it were. From the moment I became conscious of being different from outside my home was when I realised there were phrases that categorise who I was. And possibly there still are phrases that categorise who I am. So my gravestone would say something like, Maggie Semple, she lived under hyphen. And then I would say to you, the example is, she was this hyphen advantaged. She was multi hyphen cultural. And most of the hyphenated words have meaning behind them, which on some occasions and on some days feel to me quite negative. When I talk about racial injustice, and I'll just take the racial part first of all, I'm particularly looking at the colour of someone's skin. And I'm going to talk to you today from a black perspective, my perspective as being a black woman. Being uncomfortable, if you do not identify as black, being uncomfortable knowing what you do know, but you rarely articulate possibly because you want to make sure that your language is respectful, is thoughtful, absolutely, is a phase that I think most people need to go through. You may not look for it, but using language in a way that is thoughtful, respectful, situational, it's within a context, will help our discussion here. And what I'd want to say to you is, please not try to be, do not try to be part of the injustice that is going on, has been going on for, for many, many, many years, but particularly during the COVID crisis. If you watch TV, you will see more and more representation after many years of black people. So the media is a great, as you all know, a great cultural influence in all of us. And when I watch the Cambridge video by way of introduction to this um, session, I was struck with how everyone described what they wanted to say, their choice of language, and how possibly some were just beginning to think Actually, I've started this sentence. How am I going to finish it? What am I saying here? COVID has, I want to be positive about this, but COVID has forced many of us to look at that main category again. And in the private sector, in the corporate world, firms are now saying, actually, we may put BAIN together, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, who do we mean by minority ethnic? From whose world perspective are we coming from? But um, it is to do with the black component, which tends to get lost in the Asian and minority ethnic. That isn't to say that Asian minority ethnic don't have a voice. Of course, they need to have a voice too. But the racial part for me, from my perspective, is one to do with color of skin. That's my first point. My second point is this, and I make these points for you to pick up later and to ask questions and comments about, is the research um, that we, we have access to. I'm going to talk about the Corn Ferry Institute and the research that it has produced um, for the private sector, corporate UK really. And it's on the injustice, and they give some examples in a current um, piece of research, and it says something like this. Black people in business often take bigger career risks than their peers. 
they're usually more qualified, but less experienced because of lack of opportunities. And for a black executive, we call it C-suite, but someone senior in an organization, could be senior, of course, in a university, repeatedly black executives have to demonstrate that they're able to perform well in tough assignments before they can progress the corporate ladder. Whereas their co-workers are judged on potential and they're given opportunities based on that potential. Back to that, people working now from home, the opportunities when projects come up, who gets their voice heard the loudest? How do you make yourself known better in the virtual environment? COVID has brought, I think, a greater injustice, a racial injustice to all people. And in my case, because I'm arguing from a black perspective, for all people who, who are black. The other piece of research is the Voice newspaper. Um, if you don't know it, I encourage you to take a look. It's, um, a, a, it's twice, bi monthly or perhaps once a month newspaper online and in print. It's been around about 40 years in the UK um, and it's really speaking about and to the Caribbean diaspora in the UK. And what it does, the Voice, I think responsible reporting helps bring the information together so that people, the readers, can understand more. And recently, just before Christmas, December, they produced um, a COVID and health inequalities uh, commentary for readers. The IPPR and the Runnymede Trust in October 20 um, produced a report. It did say, and this is the theme I want to talk about in terms of the research, that COVID and racial injustice, there, there could be a suggestion that why people are not trusting the system, so there have to be special messaging to um, Black and Asian and minority ethnic people, is because the injustice has already been in, it already is in society, and what would make the COVID vaccination, what you're saying about who's getting, um, who's having early deaths and so on, why would we believe that? So the voice has helped us a little bit with that understanding. But it's clear from the research, it's not because black and in this case Asian people, um, and I use that broadly, but Karen's given some definition to that, um, are less well people. It is more that they work in riskier jobs. They are probably more likely to be in um, substandard housing. And they are more likely to have subpar access to healthcare. Some of the reasons. They didn't all once either been affected by COVID or not. We are not all ill people. And then the last piece, which is um, Fairview Research Limited. Again, if you take a look at them, they did a report on young black people. And this was published in December 20. And reading that, just reminded me that while COVID is, you know, you wouldn't want anyone really uh, to in kind of meet it in that way, the young people particularly, the isolation, even though they may be at home with their family, they may not be, the isolation is part of that growing more discussion about mental health, not just young people, but the report talks about that quite well. So, my third point is this, injustice, so injustice, for some, I speak for myself, but for some, it's a lived experience. How do we trust systems that have systemically worked against us? How do we do that? Where do we see the fairness? And I would say, and it's a quote from a young cleric, most of us are actually sinned against rather than sinned. So we find ourselves in a situation which 
actually, again, we're being categorized of not our own choosing. And what the racial injustice in the COVID crisis has demonstrated and shown that it's highlighted that which was already there, an unfair, unjust society. So what can we do? Well, to you, be proactive. In that video, um, I did see people commenting in a bleak way, really, about, you know, we don't, not, we don't need to do any much, but actually, um, I, I've done this unconsciously. It's, it's happened. I've recruited these people, or my department looks like this. Um, for me, I'd want a better answer than that. And I would say each one of us, all of us here, we did one thing was to be proactive. And by that, it could be, depending on where you are on, on the range, what's possible to you, you might say, and I would challenge you to this, why not each of you talk to, find someone who has a completely different view to you about racial injustice? The detractor, the naysayer, find them and have a conversation with them. Bring them with you. That's one thing. Second thing, don't be silent. This is a discussion for all of us as we're having, but all of us rely on each other to speak up. And if the environment isn't right to speak up, then we will um, find another way. Excuse me, that was um, my doorbell, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> it's going to ring again. I'll keep going. Um, and the, the, the last thing is the helpful change I heard about in that um, kind of video. Just be mindful and know that we're all part of the cultural chain. We are cultural carers ourselves. So if we want to see change, we should be thinking about how we note the culture we're working in and do something active to change it positively. Last few thoughts. Question for you. How do you engage with what you cannot see? This crisis point, COVID crisis, is too late as far as I'm concerned. This discussion, and I know in Cambridge, it is, has, it's not new in, in that sense, but this discussion about what the opportunities are is one that's highlighting the flaws, the way, the injustices of previous um, situations. Injustice fuels, I'd like to believe, our collective desire to make things better for as many as we can. In Martin Luther King's voice, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you for listening. Melinda, I could go back to you. Thank you very much, Maggie. That was a very, very thought provoking talk. And I, I'm very glad you raised the, the language of diversity and the the feeling uncomfortable with not knowing what phrases to use. And I really hope we can get some discussion going around that. And I would particularly like to hear from people with the lived experience here. And I, I'd rather suggest that we would start with that. Now you have on your screens a, a second poll, which is going to hopefully kick off our, our discussion. Um, so I hope you can all see that. Now, the Q&A, um, please type your questions in the Q&A box and I will read them out to Karen and Maggie, or if you would rather uh, raise your hand. No, I'm, I'm, hand I'm looking through the list of participants. I think that's how I see a raised hand. So please go ahead and start to ask your questions or a point of discussion that you would like to hear more about from either Karen or Maggie. And while I'm waiting for you to type, I'm going to ask both of you, there is clearly huge racial injustice in education and I think we've seen that played out in the COVID era very, very strongly. But what do you each think are the, if you had to pick out one or two things, what are the most damaging impacts of racial injustice in education and do you see anything positive coming out of COVID-19 with respect to trying to have a fair education system. So I, I don't know, I, I need to get the line, Paul's screen. So I, I don't know who would like to go first, Karen or Maggie, would you? 
Um, so I have a go, Karen, first. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, I'll just respond to the first half as I heard it. The education system, where are there still injustices or where have there been? So many moons ago, I used to work in education. I used to be a teacher and, and so on and so on and so on. And I noted then, and again, it wasn't new, and I can't stress enough that all that we're describing has met, spent decades developing itself. But I would say then, and still today, black young men particularly have a still difficult time in education. That's not denying white working class boys as well, but when I talk about education, I'm talking about before they get to university. The life chances have been significantly reduced. And the curriculum, and I know Cambridge again is doing work on this, but the curriculum still needs to represent more diverse views about the history of why we are where we are. I'll just pause there and maybe Karen wants to add. Um, that's, I, yeah, I think that's really, um, sorry, brain's working, mouth's not working. Um, I, I really like that, Maggie, and I think, uh, I think what I would probably add to it is, um, you know, not only has it, have we, we've been, we've been centuries, actually, in the making to get to this moment, not taking centuries, um, and, and I, I typically, uh, reflect on this with various institutions and groups because um, I know Melinda's heard me say this, but you cannot KPI your way out of this. Um, uh, there's no magic action plan. There's no, there's no month. There's no movie you can put on. Uh, you can't go read enough books that are going to essentially um, uh, about how to be an anti-racist that is just going to magically remove what, what is just embedded and threaded through multiple systems and institutions and structures and just, just ways of being, people's relationships with each other. Um, uh, I know I've re related this in, in other settings, but um, you know, even some of the places I have worked, uh, higher education institutions where I am followed by uh, members of uh, security who are completely convinced that I am not, uh, I shouldn't be in the spaces where you need to be a faculty member to be in, uh, or a staff member, because they just assume I can't, I couldn't possibly be a staff member. Um, you know, those are the types of embedded practice that is, it's sort of, okay, well then how do we do things, how do we do things differently? You know, what, and, and, and what do things look like? And when I, when I think about um, your question, I think Melinda, about where, where are there injustices or where, where are there problems? I mean, I, it's it's harder for me to kind of pull it out that way. It's probably similar to Maggie. This feels very everydayish to a certain extent. It's it's you know there are horrific sets of circumstances people are, are grappling with, um, and and people are, are holding on to an incredible amount of trauma. Um, but in the long arc of history, you know we're not necessarily at any newer moment uh, around injustices right now than we were a hundred years ago or fifty years ago. Um, uh, and I I take heart. One of the things that I really take heart with is the fact that every single one of us that takes a walk in this in this in this terrain at any one time are standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We're standing on the shoulders of people who have figured out through hard graft, lots of tears, uh, uh, broken dreams, and and just magic sometimes how to keep going and how to make those steps moving forward because we maybe not be able to see what those incremental changes are doing. Um, but you know, we, we are able to make moves. Um, and, and it's something about trying to, trying to live with that hope in spaces that can feel increasingly dangerous, um, almost to the, the point of being just insufferable um, in terms of moving forward. Um, and it's moments like these um, uh, that, that can be extremely important. Moments of connection, moments of quiet even, that can allow you to sort of move forward. So I'm not, I, I, I know we've both, probably Maggie and I both tried not to answer your question about where are there more problems. Um, I, I, but I think part of it is a reflection of, 
if we start creating hierarchies of where it's worse or where it's better, we don't just continue to strive. Um, and, and I think that is the message for me. Um, uh, and, I, and I think Maggie's uh, a point as well, is that it, it, it is, it's always about um, um, the hopefulness for all. Um, and we just, we just have to keep grinding it out. Okay. Um, I'm going to just come back to that point, but first of all, Diane's going to share the, the poll results. So there's clearly 100% people agree that the COVID pandemic does present an opportunity to improve racial justice, injustice, sorry. And I'm sorry, I didn't see the other poll result, Karen. Oh, sorry. Um, and that the pandemic has, 100% of people say that the COVID pandemic has highlighted racial injustice. Um, there are two questions in the Q&A, and I'm going to come to those very shortly, but I wonder, because I, I, I take your point, both, both of your points about the question I asked, and I wonder if I could just tackle it very slightly, uh, just for a few more minutes, in a different way around. If we were building an education system from scratch right now, what would be the first steps we would take? So, uh, Karen, perhaps you could start this off on this, and we're going to come back to Maggie. Um, yes, well, I guess for, for all doing full disclosure, um, uh, I used to be a secondary teacher um, about a thousand years ago. I had a, num a number of various careers and that, that would be one of them. Um, I, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I'm actually t uh, taking a lot of, um, I think, just not quite courage, but it's exciting to see is the, the communities of, of young people of, of various ages who are creating their own units. Um, and they've always done this, uh, but they're, they're, they're sharing their own knowledge. They're, they're creating their own um, learning sets and learning circles. Um, they're creating their own spaces where um, they're coming together. Uh, I, I see them on uh, every single university um, where, where, where they're not waiting for anyone to create curriculum change. They're not asking, I mean, some of them are asking, some are demanding, but they're, but they're forming their own reading groups. They're forming their own groups to kind of support and interact with each other. Um, and, and I think if I was starting again uh, and creating my own little institute unit, um, I would want them to be at the forefront of helping to shape that. Um, I, I, you know, yes, we would probably want to talk to some sort of Secretary of State for Education, yes, 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 um, and, and, and think about DFE, but I would want the young people to be right there talking to me about what they are already doing, the ways that they are shaping, the ways that they are thinking, um, and to try to co-build that together um, and, and, and have them play an active role in that. Um, uh, as opposed to essentially everyone wanting to do stuff for an education system, um, and then they lose sight of the people that um, uh, should should have the largest voice in some ways, um, and being right alongside that. So um, youth youth participation and, and activism right at the forefront. Yeah, that was me. Um, interesting, and it's a great question. And thank you, Karen, for phrasing it in the way that you have, because. Um, in the 90s, when I was a young teacher, I sat on uh, the government task group to reform the national curriculum. And so we started, I like to, I wasn't that naive politically, but a little bit naive. I thought we were starting from a, a real place of strength, which is, question, what do we want our young people going through the system to be like as adults? Mm. What values do we want them to have? How do we want them to behave? what will be important to them and therefore the curriculum is, is one aspect not the whole but an education system but the curriculum what people study and eventually became the national curriculum i.e., what everyone studies what do they study so that we as a society will have responsible adults that have heart and view things from different perspectives are truly global citizens and we went to a few places around the world to look at what they were doing because we want our people to be global citizens in all the joys and the benefits that, that brings so for me starting again would be starting from what do we want our young people to be as they progress but finally when they become adults and in our case it's when they become voting adults and all those other things what does that look like and does the curriculum that we are offering match anything near to what we want 
And depending on what's at play, is it economic, is it political, is it social, whatever it might be, needs to be balanced out. And as a Secretary of State who was bold and brave would actually um, put political aside, would put economics aside, would put really, I mean, social aside, as in um, not because someone looks like that or they're from this part of the world or this country or this part of the UK, therefore they should only know certain things about certain things. That is not global knowledge. And I can't see how in today's world, particularly as we all continue to work from in this blended way, blended way, we learn from home too more in a blended way, no doubt. I can't see how that's going to help with the mission of having truly global citizens that are active, that can speak um, and have views if we don't revisit the content of what people are learning and the way that we learn as well. That's a really good point. That, the last, that last point in particular, but it seems to me we can do a lot of these things as in starting a system afresh, we could actually be doing that now to change our system. But I, I'm going to stop there on that, but I'm going to I have three questions. So um, Joanna says, thank you to the speakers for brilliant talks. Uh, the question is, what would you advise works best as a strategy to address defensiveness of white people to, to see racial injustice and to see themselves of having a, a, a racialized identity? Um, Maggie, I'm going to come yeah. to you. Yeah. yeah, and thanks, Joanna, for the question. Um, it's one that I get in, in a, a sort of form like that um, fairly often when I describe people become defensive um, because they now think the agenda is all about them being discriminated against. And that brings you into the power relation, which I'm not going to explore necessarily here, but um, it is a very live comment, Joanna. Thank you. And when I said at the end of my in introductory comments, one thing we can all try and do is find and approach someone who disagrees with or is different from us. I think this is where this works. It, it could work well. There are people who um, become defensive. And I'll just say the phrase white privilege is one that I often use. And that immediately sends some people's backs up about white privilege. And I coach people when I can and talk to them about actually not only Joanne as you say are you part of a racial group but the fact that you're not recognizing that is seriously part of the problem and it is kind of it's colonial I mean, you know, it's imperialistic but you believe that your privilege which is white in this case isn't part of something bigger but also you are you're collaborating with it you're giving it meaning you are living it and to, to take away the defensiveness i would ask uh, someone else it wouldn't necessarily be me to make the case because i make it quite forcefully um someone who is like the other person who is being defensive to buddy up to them a very practical thing talk to them and um the minds change if they do some people take longer some people will hardly shift because they may not see the need to. And just becoming defensive is the way that they deal with it. And defensive, by the way, doesn't have to be angry or aggressive. Defensive can be very silent and non-compliant in a very subtle way, which we all learn how to do. Aaron, what about you? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I think you've, you've uh... You've given it. You've given a good, a good intro roadmap uh, for I think for me to 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 move in a in a probably a similar way. But but I would probably I would probably start with something different. Um, and uh, and 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 I would you know I, I think is it Joanne is that who it was um, for yeah. the for the question. Um, but but I think but I think um, starting with a different question. Um, in some ways, is it could be helpful, um, and, and I'll and I'll preface it that way only in the sense that, in some ways, starting with defensiveness of white people, or or, or starting with the feelings of white people, um, still makes the conversation yeah. about white people, um, uh, which is fine, 
uh, if that's if that's really what the conversation is about, then and then I, you know I, I think people should welcome that conversation about what is whiteness, what is it, what does it mean to be white, what what is that even as a category, what it, what how is it morphed and and uh, uh, manipulated around patriotism or nationalism or various various forms of language or or whatever or whatever else it might be. There's a huge amount of studies that people have done around these sets of things. Um, so people, people have terrain that they could follow for a very long time, including, um, you know, what, when and, and, and at what point in time did people in, in southern Italy, for example, become white in the United States, uh, or, or people of Irish descent became white, and they would, you can mark this actually looking at the, the laws um, and, uh, and immigration laws to really start to see, cartoons are usually one of the greatest places to see it in the press where you can really see in the 19th century significant shifts where, where certain groups would, would, would actually move into a place and then legal cases where people were arguing about uh, kind of what category that they should, they should be in. So, so that's the, you know, that would be part of that question is, is this a question about whiteness? If it's ultimately a question about uh, other, other different people, of, of different backgrounds, um, then I think there's a way of asking it about um, something like, why do we use the term minority? Like where, does, where does minority come from? What is, it, what is it supposed to signal? What is it supposed to say? Um, how is it capturing anything about particular groups of pe people? Is it about population? Possibly. Is it about politics? Is it about power? Is it about um, the ability of people to move through and mobilize within uh, society in particular ways. Well, what happens if you go a bit bigger? Let's say um, Europe or, or possibly <laughs> uh, Europe and Africa or possibly Europe, Africa and the Caribbean. Um, the more you sort of take a lens further out, the more you start to go and start to interact in spaces where you can't talk about minority peoples if you are doing a comparison of London and Nigeria or, or Lagos. Uh, you can't talk about minority peoples if you're, if you're essentially talking about uh, Jamaica um, and, uh, and London. And, and it's fascinating when people want to talk about uh, people of Caribbean descent in the UK and then also want to talk about um, any, anyone from former British uh, areas uh, or independent spaces in the Caribbean, because in the Caribbean, there are loads of different sets of people, but there are majority populations who are of a particular background. Um, and, and so that's one of the reasons that people who've been studying a lot of these systems around ethnicity and race actually start to talk about minoritization of people, right? Or majority people minoritized in a particular place. So what does that mean if you, if you come from a place where you are part of the majority peoples um, and you move to a space that minoritizes you um, uh, and suddenly, and suddenly you, you're, and, and we, we studied this as well um, uh, and study what, those, what that means to people. What, how does that reshape relationships? And this is where for, for Joanne, it's not the defensiveness. I mean, clearly we could talk about the tactics people have to respond to challenges to their worldviews or their ways of interaction. But part of it for me is how to frame the questions. Um, and, and the minute we start framing our questions quite differently and start really, I think, picking up Maggie's point, thinking about the language, we suddenly start to do different kind of work then, um, because this is work. This, it takes work to, to relearn or unlearn um, all of these sets of kind of practices and, and thinkings um, uh, because they serve, they, they serve various purposes. In some cases, those purposes are a long time ago and no one's necessarily actively engaging them, but we're still, we're still playing our part. Um, and, and it takes some really sharp effort to go, well, what happens if I change the way I think about enlightenment, right? Um, uh, and actually go, what happens if I read about what was happening in the Ottoman Empire? or what was happening within this other space. And, and I, or I wanna really understand mathematics, right? I wanna to go to some of the earliest thinkers of mathematics. Oh my gosh, they're not all white people, right? I mean, this is, these are those things that I think can provoke us to do the work that, it, that history is already there for us, but it just changes the way we start to talk um, and, and the way we start to frame. So I would really encourage Joanne to do that. Really interrogate and start to question those sets of, those sets of thinkings that isn't just, how do I deal with defensive white people? But how do I understand whiteness in the first place, right? Or, or minoritization and, and really start to span from those. 
Thank you, Karen. That's really useful. I mean, that's a discussion that we can we can be having right now, all of us. Um, uh, Loronio says minority is a way of not accepting a new reality on the part of those in power. So I just throw that out there. I'm going to ask uh, the next question. Uh, so Joanna says thank you. Thank you for the insightful and very helpful answers. Um, You're so welcome, Joanna. Claudia says, although every crisis presents an opportunity, is there really hope for true change when unfortunately the divide between the haves and the have-nots in Britain has widened throughout the pandemic, where people prefer to clap than actually actively change the system? I think that's a very good point. There's one thing to, to believe the system should change or, or in a, some sort of theoretical way to want the system to change, and there's a huge difference between that and making the system change. Um, and, I, and I'm looking at me being white here as, 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 a, as a principal player in that. So, um, I, I, I can't, so May, I'm going to start with you here. Yeah, I'm getting an emotional response that I'm just kind of uh, calmly thinking this through, which is, um, well, for me, it, it, we have to turn this into an opportunity for true change. I, I can't, and Karen, I know, and actually, Melinda, you too, you know, and none of us are having this discussion um, not wanting to see change. So the very nature of who we are um, means that we change in our way the things that we can change and we can influence and so on. Um, I think, so first of all, Claudia, yes, although every crisis presents an opportunity, is there really hope for true change? I think yes. And I tell you what I really seriously hoped for, that as we become more able to manage COVID and all that that has brought about, it has enabled some of us, I hope most of us, to reset aspects of who we are and how we run our lives and what we do. Mm -hmm. And that reset will depend on who you are and what power, however you want to describe that, you have, an influence you have, and you're therefore attitude um, to be a, a campaigner or an activist or be a mini activist, whatever it is, I'm hoping that this is forcing us to reset. And I'm also hoping, which is why I started with the useful and, un and the kind unlimited quote, um, was because I'm hoping people become kinder. Regardless of those who have and have not, I'm hoping that humanity, that we will become kinder. You're absolutely right. The divide between the have and have not has got greater. What can those of us who can do? Well, yeah, we may want to clap, but, and that's a democratic process, um, but some people, that's what they want to do. And I, I can't force them to think, of course, anything else other than believe that I'm not the only person, we are not the only people discussing this, wanting things to change. There are growing numbers of people that are using this opportunity to actually force sometimes change that which we know has not been fair in previous times. So I am optimistic. Um, I believe greatly in people and the power that they have, no matter what their economic status, no matter where they live in the UK particularly, um, there is something about small movements, small actions making a huge difference. Thank you. Yeah, I think I would echo that. Um, uh, and and so full disclosure, I, I am a I am a pessimistic optimist. <laughs> 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 or or depending upon you know how 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 uh, how you feel about um, uh, any kind of astrology, I am I am a, a Sagittarius uh, drifting into Capricorn. So so no. you know. <laughs> It, yeah, there's no hope. Um, and part of that is that I, I, I share Maggie's kind of optimism, uh, but, I, but, I, but I'm also deeply, deeply annoyed with humans. <laughs> deeply. Um, any, any sort of look at history across multiple spaces in, in various different contexts just allows you to just sort of go, oh my gosh, why are we back here at this thing again? Um, uh, and, uh, and I, and I, and I totally recognize that kind of frustrated feeling, um, of, uh, this will never change. This is getting worse. It feels 
suffocating. Why, 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 right? I totally understand that. Um, but I think the, the energy and enthusiasm that took people to the streets last summer um, after the death of George Floyd, uh, which is not the first instance of, of, of anything that tragic happening, um, uh, but it galvanized, I think, certain sets of people in ways that um, they felt like they had to go to the streets, they had to walk with their neighbors, they had to raise their placards up. Um, but they've been, you know, people have been doing this for millennia. Um, uh, and, and, they, and they haven't stopped. They haven't decided that today I'm tired and I won't. Um, they, haven't, they haven't decided that uh, the laws are a particular way, so I, I, won't, I won't try to change that law. They hadn't decided that, um, uh, you know, this is too hard. Um, and maybe not everybody can do it. Some have to live in the here and now and just keep their head down, do their job, love, their, love themselves and their families. Um, but I have faith that there are always going to be those who will continue to shine that light for us um, uh, and create opportunities and spaces for people to play their role. Um, and, and I know what I can do. Uh, what I can do, as I have said many times, is my, my, my job is to be of service. Um, and and I'm, that's what I'm using my privilege for, um, is, is to be of service. And sometimes it's mentoring and supporting others. Sometimes it's sitting in really awkward rooms, trying to, <laughs> trying to fight some fights um, and pushing stuff forward. Um, and, 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 and other times it's, it's, it's really trying to do the hard scrabble. But, but, but part of that is, is not anybody else's guilt trip to them about what they are not doing but it's a strong recognition of what I can do. But, but what I fundamentally believe is I can do that every day in the smallest way, the absolute smallest way, like how I greet people, how I walk into a room, who I, who I talk to, how I give opportunities for other people, um, how, how I help somebody else's light to shine, which is not all about me, um, uh, all the way through to the big giant stuff that, that, that I can be involved in. Because again, when we're talking about these mentally, these sets of things, it's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's at every scale. It's the small, the incremental, the intimate, the, the, the familial, the, the interpersonal, all the way through to the institutional um, uh, and, and the large. Um, and, and so what, what keeps me going is the belief that I, I want to live in a world that is just and equitable. Um, and, and, and it's not even just that I'm going to keep doing it to be there, but I, I deserve that world, right? You deserve that world. We all deserve that world. Um, and that will just continue to motivate me to wake up every day and continue to live as if it exists, right? Um, uh, and, to, and, to, and, to, and, to, and to live that kind of truth. That is the truth for me. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to drag everything else to that truth. Um, and that may take some time and that may take uh, an incredible amount of graph, but it'll take co-conspirators, um, other people who, who, can, who can play with you um, to be able to do that. So you're not feeling like you're doing it all on your own and a recognition that it's happening everywhere um, with people having these kind of conversations. Because um, that's the magic uh, when you start to realize you're not the only voice um, and the only person, uh, there, there are people everywhere. Thank you, Karen. I, there's, there's so many points I want to raise from that, but I, I'm in time. So I'm just going to, there's one last question uh, from Evan, who says, Karen, you mentioned briefly the impact of the pandemic on PGRs. The group Pandemic PGRs recently released a report on the impact that UKRI's current COVID funding extension strategy will have on stressing the current inequalities in science and academia. They call for a blanket six month funding extension for UK PGRs, postgraduate research students. Uh, rather than dealing with extensions on a case-by-case -case basis. What can we do as researchers, a department or a university to support this call? Um, well, I, 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 won't, I won't go into any details about any particular person's uh, choice of extensions um, uh, or, um, or uh, and it just, just because it, I, I think it would just be un unfair. Um, uh, but I will say the pandemic but the pandemic PGRs are one of a set of a whole set of people. Yeah. We've, we've got a sector that is bleeding. Um, and uh, so I could, I could talk about technicians. I could talk about mid-career people. I could talk about whole units that have been closed down um, and, uh, and, 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 and people are fur furloughed uh, and then not hired again. 
uh, of folks on teaching contracts, so those teaching contracts are gone. Um, posts that were out and people going in for those posts, and those posts aren't happening. Um, and uh, and we, we all know and suspect that there will be future closures um, uh, of, of institutions. Um, so this, this is, again, not in any way to, to deny the critical importance of the PGRs. But, but, I, but I, I continue to flag at every scale and every level that this is a sector problem we've got. Um, and we've got, we've got a number of sector challenges and we can't pit any group against each other when we start to think about mitigations um, and moving forward because we shore up PGRs and then we lose mid-career people um, uh, or, or we, move, we remove admin or we remove research offices or you have no cleaning staff. Um, or you have no security because your institution has no financial stability to be able to, because people are making various decisions across this board. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that for me, this is a systems issue. Um, uh, it's one with differential impacts uh, with undoubtedly, and, and those will, will create those differential futures for, for people. But the more we keep all of those parts moving in our head, the more we can realize, okay, if I do something over here, what's the effect over there? Um, uh, and, and how do we give people some, some advice and guidance and sometimes some frameworks that will allow some movement. Um, and, and, and that's one of those instances where there is ongoing dialogue and kind of interaction kind of moving forward. But I would really encourage every researcher to just think about the health of their facilities, to think about you know, the decision-making, the conversations that are happening, the trade-offs, almost everybody's having budget conversations right now. These are big, huge sector questions. Um, and, and, we, and, and much less the private sector, as Maggie knows very well, is having some of the similar sets of dynamics. And I think the more we can have these transparently and the more we can have them with just, with just kindness and, comp and, and just confidence in each other, I think the, the more we can start to move forward because the, the, the impacts are not going to go away. Um, uh, we, we think we may be in two years of this, um, and maybe even longer in terms of real, real pressures on, this, on the system, um, uh, on people and also on, on finances. Um, and uh, and we, we, we really do just need to continue to build and build equitably moving forward, but also just recognize that this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is one where everybody is impacted. Um, and, and, I, and I would just really encourage people to think about all the staff um, and all of their students as much as they possibly can. Thank you. Um, sorry, there's one more, there's a, a poll just come up, but I just wanted to, um, on this topic, just to go to Maggie. Maggie, it strikes me that what, what's behind this question is perhaps another example of, of, of people with black skins having to prove themselves first, people with white skins have opportunity based on potential. And I mean, I think we can all reflect on that. But I just wonder, it, it's clear we need to be, people need to be given opportunity based on potential, regardless of, regardless of other factors, and most in particular, regardless of skin colour. Where do we start to, in, in, a, in a hiring process or a funding process, can you give us one or two practical examples of where we start to get rid of this, this, this kind of discrimination, which I suspect that many of us are aware of, I say, in the abstract, but when we're actually facing a situation, are there some practical aspects we can do? So the first, yeah, yes, thank you for the question. One is, um, first of all, all of us, we can be our own conscience on this. Ask yourself and then ask each other, in a hiring situation, for example, um, we're, we're moving towards making decision, but can we just make sure that the evidence that we have seen, we have shared the thoughts and the process across all the people that we've met. So I think holding yourself, speaking, you know, looking, looking to your own conscience and then saying to your colleagues, can we just review this again so we take time? Mm. I think it's very important, very, very important. Often, there's lots of research that shows us we go into those hiring situations in a panel situation and it's all, it's all sorts of biases, the Regency effect and so on, but it's, it is basically who has left you when they walk out the room feeling warmer towards them than others. And what we never have is a discussion about why do you think that? What's that based on? Well, they said this. And, and there's a whole piece about people 
being able to talk in a certain shortcut language, which everyone gets because they've experienced the system that others new to it won't have. So be your own conscience, be conscious of other people, be accountable to them. Um, take your time, really. If you really want to truly look at um, fairness, take your time and be prepared to be uncomfortable. Be prepared not to be the expert. Be prepared for someone. And if there's a hierarchy, usually there isn't kind of panel situations when you, you recruit people, uh, when up and hire people. Listen to that quieter voice in, in the room. It, it, those are the sorts of things that we could do. And start with the quietest voice. Hey, Maggie, what did you think about, about that person, for example? Or you ask that sort of question, did they answer it well from your point of view? And so on. Um, so interrogate each other, but do it um, with, I would say, some firms actually have a discussion. This might not suit everyone, but they have a discussion about generally the candidate. And then they look at this candidate from a particular, I mean, the hat, you know, but a particular view. And they look at the, the three people who've got in front of them and say, so in terms of our kind of equalities or diversity or our um, broader cultural aspects, how does this person answer those questions, which are all competency based? course questions I should I took that for granted actually competency based questions that, um, that we can then start looking at someone in a particular lens and overall then it equals this so that, those might be some things I would do and expect to see really. thank you I've been writing those down <laughs> um, Claudia says thank you for your inspiring for your inspiring replies and Evan says thanks very thoughtful response I'm, I'm, I'm being triggered by Diane to, to wrap up so people can uh, have a break before the next one. But I just very briefly, if I could ask, 30 seconds each, could I ask first Karen, then Maggie, what would you like us to take away from today? What, if, if there's something, in terms of action, what would you like to see happen next? And I, I'm sorry to push you on time, but I say if I could ask you to be brief um, on this. Um, I I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, that people can leave this feeling hopeful. I, I, I actually, I actually, th I, mean, I think there's just, we don't, we underestimate that and we jump to solutions and sometimes we, we jump to actions and we, we jump to transformation, but, but I, I take, I put a lot of stock in hope um, and, uh, and, and keeping it alive and feeding it so that, so that you can really feel that and it can energize you. Um, so, so it's a big one for me is, is that they leave this feeling hopeful um, and, and not despondent. Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and if they can just maybe even listen to this every so often, because I think it's going to be recorded um, and, and give themselves a boost or watch the videos, um, you know, do these sorts of things that just give you that little bit of juice into your cell, um, uh, which would be great. And, and, and I think the, the poll that Diane has shared with us, I think um, I think people are going away with some hope. But Maggie, if I could just ask you, what would you like us to take away? Or what would okay. like us to happen after this? Yeah, so for me, I would answer my own question. Um, how do you engage with that which you cannot see? And for me, I would answer it. So I'm asking everyone to, ask, to take that question away and answer it. Um, you can do it in your head, of course, intellectually, but actually I want to see that turned into action. So I'd encourage people to you know, think, how do you engage with what you cannot see? And for me, I'm going to go and find someone. I say find someone, I mean, you know, just I'll do it nicely. <laughs> but, you know, kind of, find someone who, um, actually I don't have to find them at all, they find me, there's many of them, who disagree exactly. with me <laughs> on the particular aspect we've been talking about injustice today. Um, and to be honest, I say to people, thank you so much for telling me your views that I disagree with completely, but it has helped me sharpen my own thinking and my own views. So that's how I view it positively in that way. Thank you very much. Maybe we should suggest that next time you get somebody asking yeah. them, explaining to you about they can't engage with what they can't see, you should direct the, um, the questions to, to one of the audience here. Yeah. Um, uh, Thank you very much, Maggie and Karen. That's a very thoughtful session. And I have to say, I, I've just got so many pieces of paper now with notes scribbled down and things I need to, <laughs> to take forward, think about, do. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if we can give a round of applause electronically, but please, if you can. Hey, I can. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> 
for the, for a really inspiring and thoughtful session. So I'm, I'm just going to clap. Down here somewhere. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Very much appreciated. Um, Very much. Yeah. Um, we will now have a 15 minute break. Uh, so we will start the next session at, uh, I can't add up, um, um, 15.35 rather than 15.30, if that's okay with people, to give people a chance for a quick break between now and then. Thank you very much. Thank you.